Welcome everybody to our um, webinar series and uh, and it's great to start in 27, uh, 2021 on such a good note. Um, today we have Doria Abdullah who's going to talk to us about international education in Malaysia. Malaysia being not only a very important middle income country becoming a, an upper middle income country in fact when you look at the data but a, a major provider of international education and has been for two and a half decades uh, especially within the within the um, East Asian South Asian region and um, I should say welcome to those of us who are joining for the first time and those of us who've been regular participants in our webinar series and I hope you had a good um, Christmas and New Year break in the Western world as it is. And uh, uh, you uh, are looking forward to a, a good 2021. I won't come out with all those trite homilies about how, what a terrible year it was in 2020 and how we really hope 2021 is going to be better because it does look awfully similar to 2020, but there are always positive sides. And our webinar series for us has been great. And I think for many of our participants, judging by the feedback, it's becoming a valued part of the higher education research scene. Um, and let me say at the start of the series in 2021, two things. Thank you to Trevor Trehan, who does such a great job in facilitating the series. And also I put out a general invitation to the, especially to those of you who are, participate regularly. If you'd like to develop a webinar in our series, you're most welcome to do that. Um, do write to me directly um, at CG using my Oxford address and I'll start to discuss that with you in terms of detail and timing and so on. Um, we generally uh, welcome regional uh, and world level discussion, but we do have places for country specific studies as well, like we do today. So let me quickly move through the webinar protocols and then to introduce Doria properly. Um, the um, webinar is being recorded as per usual and will be posted online on the CG website. Uh, we say in due course, but usually that means within 24 hours and certainly 48 hours or so. Uh, and we're finding that the YouTube version of our webinar is being used as much as the or more than the uh, direct participation opportunity is being used. Please keep yourself muted um, unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, and but please do so when you're brought into the discussion in, in a form of question or statement. Um, we recommend using speaker view uh, so you can see more clearly who's talking at any given time. To ask a question, use the chat function. The chat function will be um, posted on the, on the CG website after the webinar, and it's important to put a public aspect of the webinar. We also use it to compose question time. Uh, and when your question goes in there, I'll uh, juggle it around and, to, and, uh, and create a speaking order for the different questions. Um, and they'll, they tend to be uh, arranged in order of reception, but also in order of relevance to the topic of the, of the webinar. So that the more sharply they address what our speaker is saying, the more likely they are to be um, part of the discussion. Also, I advise you to come in early, as I always say, late um, uh, questions received in, in the chat in the last five, 10 minutes often miss out, and which is a pity because they're usually quite good questions by that stage. So do, do come forward and I advise you to start writing questions before Doria finishes if you can. Now, let me now pass to Doria and say how pleased we are that she has developed the webinar today. She's been an active participant in the series um, as, as a uh, participant um, audience member and has asked lots of questions over the, the, the last few months. Um, she's a senior lecturer at the School of Education and the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities at UTM, University Technology Malaysia, um, one of the major uh, for higher education institutions in the country. She specializes in higher education policy with practical experience in developing policies on higher education since 2011. And amongst the um, policies she's worked on, having She's worked on internationalization policy for higher education Malaysia, the operational framework for international student management in Malaysian higher education system, shift date, uh, global prominence, Malaysian education blueprint, higher education, 
2015 and Kuala Lumpur de Declaration on Higher Education in conjunction with Malaysia's ch chairmanship of ASEAN in 2015. So Doria, the floor is yours. We expect you'll speak for about 25 to 30 minutes and then we'll go into Q&A. All right, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Simon. Uh, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and present in the first uh, CGHE session for 2021. Now, uh, I would like to extend um, um, my thanks to uh, Trevor for uh, helping me with the technical details just now, and as well as my uh, professors, my students who joined in to the session today. So um, thank you so much. Uh, now let me share my slide. You should be able to see a PowerPoint slide. We, we can see that, the... Doreen, thanks. All right. Okay, so let me change it to, all right. So uh, let me begin. Uh, so um, this particular presentation focuses on my postdoc research, um, how local students look at the um, internationalization of uh, Malaysian higher education. So um, now uh, a bit of context, Malaysia, as Prof. Simon mentioned just now, is very much focusing on recruiting international students. We have been a host for international students for a number of times. It is even listed in uh, our aspiration uh, to be a, a hub for international students. Now, um, it for the higher education blueprint focuses specifically on the internationalization agenda. So uh, the target that we, we aim for is actually 200,000 international students by 2020. We know that didn't quite happen because of COVID. Um, we are also focusing on um, recruiting 250,000 international students by 2025. Again, uh, this remains a big question whether we can achieve it or not, uh, given the current conditions. Now, uh, this slide uh, gives an overview of the number of international students that are in Malaysia, at least for the past 16 years. So um, we have seen an increase uh, over the years. Um, the pattern is almost the same, um, meaning uh, number one, uh, the private institutions are the major recruiters for international students. Uh, however, number two, um, the public sector has slowly begin to catch up in terms of uh, the international students recruited. And uh, there is this um, differentiation between the type of students that came into the system. So for uh, students at the private sector, it's uh, mainly at the degree level. Um, while for public uh, universities, we are mainly hosting students at the postgraduate level. Uh, this is because there is a certain cap to um, the number of international students that we can host at the degree level. However, it is not being kept at the postgraduate level. So um, this is an interesting slide that, um, that I would like to share with everyone. Um, the Rather than saying Malaysia welcomes everyone from all, all uh, corners of the world, it might be better off if we uh, mention that um, Malaysia is very much a region-specific region recruiter. So we, our, the, the sending countries are pretty much consistent throughout the years. We're talking about uh, Indonesia, China, Iran, um, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Bangladesh, um, Libya, Iraq, I think I missed out a number of countries there. So these are the consistent uh, standing countries. So um, it, it points to a regionalization of higher education rather than um, internationalization of higher education. All right, uh, now um, it is good for me to share what happens in terms of uh, the COVID updates. Uh, we are still accepting students at current point of time. I have a few students who are stuck outside. Um, at their home countries. So um, the students who are coming in, uh, we're going to open our campus uh, on the 1st of March for physical um, learning sessions. So uh, international students, when they come in, they have to go through testing, uh, quarantine. Uh, all costs for quarantine will be borne by the international students themselves. So um, for more information, uh, as this is a rolling update, um, Education Malaysia Global Services website, uh, that's the um, government we um, a company guaranteed by uh, the Ministry of Higher Education uh, to manage international students. 
um, the official announcement should be made on that website. So I would um, um, advise you if you like more updates, please go on to the uh, Education Ministry Global Services website. Now this is the um, uh, the start of the actual uh, presentation. Um, now um, this part, as I mentioned earlier, this particular uh, study stems out from my uh, PhD uh, research. So uh, in my PhD research, I look at how should Malaysia manage international students and what kind of frameworks that we can uh, present in order to regulate um, or support. Um, the, the international student population in the country. But uh, one important component that wasn't being uh, studied is uh, the other side, meaning to say how domestic students um, look at the, uh, in general, uh, the increasing number of international students in the country. And uh, the, the voice of the domestic students in terms of the internationalization agenda um, is not really uh, being heard. Uh, in fact, if I can say on record that uh, non-existent. So we didn't really go and ask them, uh, so what do you think about the number of, uh, the increasing number of students here? Um, are you okay with that? Uh, do you benefit from it? So um, for my postdoc research, I actually focuses on this angle. Um, now uh, for this particular study, um, the definition uh, of internationalization at home uh, by Bilan uh, is being applied uh, just to uh, set the the um, the scene right. So this um, concept generally refers to uh, instruments and activities that you do at your home campus in order to make sure that uh, the num the students that are not going out uh, for either semester exchanges abroad or um, study abroad in initiatives um, benefit. From the uh, from internationalization in terms of in, in particular intercultural uh, learning. Now um, this is uh, um, interesting component to be tested. Uh, now uh, Harrison highlighted that there are five general components uh, uh, with regard to internationalization at home, and by the end of this study, you would have uh, presentation. Sorry. By the end of this presentation, you have seen that there are, uh, this particular component uh, will be tested. Um, so the general components include uh, the pre using or optimizing the presence of international students uh, for the local students to learn interculturally, um, curriculum, uh, enhancing the curriculum through internationalization of curric uh, curriculum, that being a very big component of internationalization at home, uh, global citizenship, uh, as well as the dynamics that occur in the classroom, mainly between international student and domestic student at the same time, uh, international staff with students. So these are the research questions uh, that I studied. Um, slight digression, uh, the background is actually my campus in Johor Bahru, um, taken from the top hill of uh, the, the, the university. So uh, what do domestic students think about, number one, uh, the flow of international students, number two, the increased focus of international rankings that didn't get talked about uh, in the local context, and number three, um, the increase of international uh, collaboration in the campus. So um, the site of the study, as Prof. Simon mentioned just now, is University Technology Malaysia, uh, to be called UTM. Um, it's a public research university. Um, it, this study is a very small study, uh, only happened for one year. So the, the limitation of the study is that um, you only have a very small sample of uh, respondents to the study. It's a qualitative um, research so uh, through a focus group discussion. So uh, what happened is that um, the I searched for students to come in and talk to me uh, informally uh, about their experience and their understanding on uh, internationalization. Um, the sessions, I have to assure the students that it is anonymous, uh, their responses are anonymous, and um, they can use um, a mixture of Bahasa Malaysia, that's the national language, as well as in English, uh, to express their opinion. So um, post uh, focus group discussion, uh, transcripts were made, uh, summary notes were, 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 uh, were made, and the teams were extracted. So uh, these are the questions. Uh, imagine uh, you and me sitting together in the focus group discussion. So uh, we come, we start with self-introduction um, and then the purpose of the study, 
uh, some disclaimer statements, and then we move on to the components, um, their experiences uh, with international students, international staff, uh, and their understanding on um, different components that we commonly associate with internationalization, mainly, mainly international uh, collaboration rankings. And final question is whether they consider this particular site of study is an international university. So first finding, um, all of the students are actually undergraduate students. Um, only four of them have experience studying abroad. And uh, fortunately, uh, all of them have uh, to varying degrees experience interacting with international students and uh, international um, staff. Now, with regard to experience uh, with international faculty, um, over the next few slides, you'll be seeing um, speech bubbles in two different colors, uh, blue and green. I would like you to highlight, uh, to look at the green speech bubbles because those are the distinctive features uh, that came up from this study. So uh, with regard to their um, experience with international faculty, um, some common grouses were that um, they can't understand the international staff um, in terms of pronunciation, the speed of teaching, the accent. Um, and, uh, but they like their experience because uh, apparently this international faculty um, uses different techniques uh, in teaching. Um, they are more practical, more industry focused and give more examples. Now, uh, what I would like to highlight here, which is quite interesting, is the fact that um, the, the, respondents, the respondents did ask, what do you mean by internationalization of curriculum? Apparently, it didn't happen in engineering. It's a standard uh, UTM being um, an engineering-focused university. Uh, but uh, it's very important. It's a given, and it has to happen for social science programs. Um, and another interesting point to highlight is that uh, it is the domestic students that decide to adjust to how the international staff work uh, and teach rather than the other way around. Okay, I'm, I have like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes left. So I'm going to go quickly uh, through the presentation. Now with regard to um, the students experience with international students, uh, not pleasant. Um, they had difficulties in terms of group work. Um, they do not like sudden uh, addition of new international students in the course sections because that will disrupt learning. Uh, language breakdown uh, issues mainly, uh, which will lead to communication background. But uh, one thing that they like about having international students in the classroom is the fact that these students ask questions and this is very different as compared to the domestic academic culture where students don't really ask questions. The fourth finding, um, interaction with international students in social setting, um, conventional uh, points apply in terms of these international students always go in groups um, and then uh, specific to my university, um, the respondents highlighted that if you want to find international students, go to the library because that is where they study, that is where they hang out. Uh, but um, interesting finding with regard to this particular team is that uh, the relationship between domestic students and the international students are very functional, um, meaning that beyond uh, academic context, they will not interact with one another. Um, how, uh, and another interesting point to highlight is that these domestic students they really want to make friends with international students. However, they don't know how to go about. So uh, among the statements that lead to this particular um, uh, interpretation is that uh, um, they worry whether they, they use the right words, to uh, whether um, they address these students in the right way. So they don't know how to go about uh, making friends with international students. But an um, interesting point uh, highlighted by one of the respondents is that if they were to be in the same situation, they would also go and find uh, people from their own nationalities to, uh, to be together just for the comfort. So in one sense, the students understand uh, how these international students work uh, in terms of their experience in the university. Um, this is a very controversial slide. I'm, I, I have doubts uh, when, when I put this on. 
Um, now, the domestic students highlighted um, another adjustment uh, strategy that they did with regard to managing the interaction between international students and staff. Uh, it depends on which country that they come from. So they uh, if I could put it uh, simply, is that they prefer working with uh, international students and staff that are closer to Malaysia, meaning to say Indonesia, Thailand, Brunei, uh, Japan, South Korea. Um, they have adverse feelings or uh, they are reluctant to interact with uh, students from specific regions of the world. Um, and there are preconceived notions with regard to uh, the, the, the students and staff from these regions. Uh, finding number six, uh, now we're getting to the institutional uh, overview. So when, uh, when I ask the question, do you understand why the university recruits international students? Uh, most of them, yes, they, they, they did understand uh, it's about money, it's about reputation. Um, however, they have uh, some reservations. One of the reservations is that, uh, is there a way for the university to cap the number of international students that, uh, that come in? Number two, is there a way to diversify uh, where do they come from? And number three, uh, based on their experience in terms of the language breakdown, uh, is there a way to control the, quality, the perceived quality uh, of uh, international students that come to the university? Uh, finding number seven, uh, when asked about international rankings and international collaboration, most of them understand uh, why the university do what they have to do. Uh, however, the main point to highlight in this slide is that um, they didn't benefit from, from this international rankings and international collaboration. Um, other than the narration that if you are higher up, uh, on top of the rankings, um, you are more employable. Beyond that, there's no other benefit that they get. So um, um, their assumption is that even without international rankings and international collaboration, business will still proceed as usual. And this should be the final finding that I will, I, I'm presenting uh, for this particular uh, study. Um, the last question is, do you consider the university as an international university? Uh, most of them said no. In terms of the tangible indicators, number of stud international students, number of international collaboration, number of international student uh, staff, yes, uh, the university is an international university. But in terms of services, facilities, um, they didn't think that it is up to mark. And uh, it is interesting to, uh, to realize that they actually highlighted that at the end of the day, this university is actually a university that serves um, national interest. So at the end, um, the university has to emphasize on domestic needs. So um, coming back to Harrison's components on internationalization of uh, at home. So there are three main questions to, to look at. Number one, um, how do we remove the systematic barriers that uh, affect interaction between local and international students? And we're talking about organic interaction. Uh, number two, um, over the past year, um, there is this concept on internationalization, internationalization at a distance. Essentially, it means that we are using technology to uh, encourage um, intercultural learning. So how do we, in a post-COVID environment, leverage on that? And finally, uh, what type of intervention uh, beyond training and personal development that we can work on in order to enhance intercultural competency among staff, given that these are the core agents that interact with the international students. So this is the final slide. Um, in terms of implications for policy and practice, I only want to highlight two things. Number one, uh, for universities to embark on internationalization activities, please explain your rationals and uh, how that would benefit uh, the domestic students. And number two, at the national level, uh, perhaps it might be good to relook really at how the country focuses on internationalization, uh, especially in terms of the uh, higher education blueprint, the particular strategic trust on internationalization. Are we hitting the right notes or are we um, on focusing on growing the numbers? So with that, uh, thank you so much, uh, Prof. Simon, I'm passing the uh, flow back to you. Looking forward to the questions. Let me stop sharing. 
Oh, a fabulous um, slides they were, um, Victoria. That was a really good presentation and very informative. Um, and you know, your research really does gel with uh, all of us who've worked on um, these problems of relations between international and local students. Very similar findings seem to come up again and again. Um, this problem of um, of lack of, uh, of real empathy and close friendship between local and international students is something that disappoints international students, I think, because they they look to, you know, forging good uh, good bonds, making new real friends, not just high by type yes. friends, but real exactly. friends, you know, with, with, with locals. And locals are in a different world. They don't need international students to be friends with. Uh, they've got their own friends uh, and, uh, and, you know, they haven't got the same driver. Um, uh, this is, it's a very difficult problem. Um, sometimes, of course, it, it, it does work out. You know, you do see local students who really do um, form proper friendships with international students and benefit from that and change and so on. Um, do you see, um, do you have any thoughts about what the way forward is? I mean, I, I think there's a limit to the extent to which we can pre-structure this through institutional interventions or yes, policy, actually. you know? How, um, how can we create the environment which maximizes the chance of local students being prepared to change enough so that they can really start to take an interest in international students properly? Um, I can only talk about uh, the university context. Um, now, um, a few of the respondents actually highlighted that um, the international office did organize activities uh, uh, that tries to make sure that the domestic and the uh, international students learn from one another. These are mainly uh, informal activities uh, when they go to, uh, they go and visit places prior, prior to COVID, of course. But uh, again, these are very, uh, these are activities that are limited in numbers and also limited in participation. So, uh, which brings me back to um, the another point to highlight, uh, you shouldn't institutionalize this. Uh, because it won't mm. work. Um, Force uh, deliberate uh, items doesn't work. So, um, which leads to another point. Uh, it, it will be good to um, look at how international, uh, how staff in general manages the interaction. Because at the end, these are the people that work most with um, the uh, the international uh, uh, students. Um, another angle to look at is actually um, the student support structure, um, whether you are actually leveraging on the domestic students move. There will be a group of students who are eager to make friends with the international students. So can we empower them to organize more activities, sports activities mainly? Uh, a few of, of the respondents actually highlighted that um, when you play sports, especially football, um, the barriers are removed. So um, mm -hmm. I think uh, the university has to be creative um, and it, most importantly, do not put it at the central level. I'm not sure if that answers your question though, Prof. No, you did very well, but um, I was also tempted to ask you about um, the, the, the differences between, um, you know, the, the, or the perceptions of differences between international students, you know, how some are nice and some are not so nice, but that's such a minefield that I think I'll, it's while well, it's yeah, right. that, that's a point that. <laughs> stimulating to think about, I think I might leave it, leave that minefield to you. But I think <laughs> Sylvie Loma later on is going to ask a question about that. Now, our oh, first no. question, we pride of place goes to Darren McDermott, who, who came in first and has a good question. Darren, can you come in, please? Uh, thanks very much, Simon, and thank you, Doria. That was a, an excellent presentation. Hi there. Really Hi. interesting. Um, I, I always forget how close we are geographically, but uh, I think at the, at the current time, it seems quite far away. Um, I, as you know, uh, I'm, I'm involved in uh, support to higher education in the ASEAN region, which is an EU program. Uh, and I'm always keen to hear from academics around the region what their sense is on the, the interest uh, of their, their institutions and I suppose their, their national policies uh, to attract more ASEAN students uh, into, into programs. Do you think um, it could address uh, maybe the, the sense of internationalization among students if there, there is a, a greater number um, of students from the region um, present on, on their campus? 
Okay, uh, thanks, Darren, for the question. Now, um, I'm not so sure if I'm directly addressing uh, uh, what you're asking, but uh, with regard to ASEAN um, as, a, as a context, I think uh, the elephant in the room is still whether um, um, individuals from the, from the region um, identify themselves to the, the, the common identity that is ASEAN. Um, sure. I would say um, rather than we focus on uh, big, um, okay, for share, if I understand it correctly, we have semester based uh, activities, but probably uh, to extend it further, um, it might be good for, um, for us to consider short term activities, probably online activities as well. Um, a few respondents from the study actually highlighted that they are keen to, to go abroad. Um, it's just a matter of um, funding because um, previously uh, the university did uh, provide a certain seed fund for students to, to move about, especially mm -hmm. within the region, but um, things happen and the, the funds are slashed. So um, eventually that restricts movement of students. So perhaps if we can think about coming back to the ASEAN context, um, whether we can organize uh, short-term activities other than the conventional um, semester-based exchanges. Uh, right. That address your, uh, no, question. That's, that's perfect. Thank you very much, Doria. I'll Thanks, Darren, back. for so, supporting me tonight. Thanks a lot. Thank you both. Um, uh, Jonathan uh, Burpel, I apologize, Jonathan, I didn't give you enough warning, but we'd like to have your question now if we can. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, Jonathan. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, um, yeah, my name is Jonathan. I'm a PhD student in at the University of Cambridge. So I research about um, refugees and higher education in Malaysia. Um, but I was interested to know if alongside this policy of internationalization of higher education, has there been any move um, on the secondary side in terms of preparation for entering into an international environment? Um, and has there been any so I was just kind of thinking maybe students who come from a like an international school background might have had very different experiences that allow them to access that kind of environment a bit better than students who have been in a mostly kind of um, monocultural secondary school. Okay, uh, I'm not so sure if I get your question, but if I can repeat the question. Um, you are concerned with, um, is there a particular initiative that we can do to prepare students for the international uh, environment? Yeah, so it's kind of before okay. the students go to go into university. Ah, uh, that's actually a, a, a good question. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for addressing it. I think um, somewhere uh, in, in mid last year, um, PISA 2000, not PISA, uh, mid last year, uh, somewhere end of last year, PISA actually releases the 2018 uh, edition of that particular assessment. And one of the items that were highlighted is actually global citizenship. So I would, um, I don't have the exact question to your <laughs> answer to your question, but I would suggest you to uh, go and check out that document because that document actually highlighted um, is there a way for us to inculcate uh, global citizenship from young, meaning to say primary, secondary, uh, before they actually come into um, higher education? So that's an interesting report. And I think somewhere in mid last year, there was another group of researchers, um, Dar Dr. Dara Dirdof, uh, also issued another uh, similar study on uh, intercultural, how do you um, develop intercultural competency? So uh, the, the method that was used is actually uh, story circles where you gather people uh, together and then you learn from the experiences of each other based on a set of uh, things to do. So um, to address your question and to sum it up, uh, there's no direct answer to that. Uh, I think a lot of us are still exploring how should we get stu our students, our children ready for the international environment. Hopefully that addresses the, 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 your, your question, Jonathan. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, 
I have next questions from Sayong Lee. Hi, um, hello everyone. Hi Doria, thank you for your presentation. Hi. Yeah, it was very interesting to hear your presentation today because I'm also studying international students in South Korea, not South Korea, South Korean international students. But my question is about your interesting findings about dis disciplinary differences in the perception of students about the internationalization of curriculum. If okay. I understand correctly, you said that students perceived it differently from social yeah. science discipline and STEM. Correct. So could you please elaborate this finding? Okay, uh, that finding was surprising to me as well uh, because um, I generally thought based on the uh, studies conducted by previous scholar, especially Prof. Betty Lee's, um, it seems that, you know, uh, internationalization of curriculum can be implemented across the mm -hmm. spectrum. But for this particular group of respondents, didn't affect them that much. Um, for engineering students, uh, apparently what happened is that uh, there's a standard to follow regardless of where you are in the world. So um, it's a matter of uh, application. So if the equations are the same, there's nothing much you can do about it other than applying it. But for social science students, um, especially those in business, mm -hmm. um, it makes a difference because uh, you, it's one thing to learn about theories, but it's another thing to actually look at how that particular theory is applied and uh, adjusted differently based on different contexts of the world. Mm -hmm. So um, when I ask this question to the respondents, I get pretty disappointing results from the engineering students. But for the business students, um, this interesting finding came out. So I think mm -hmm. hopefully that addresses uh, uh, your, your, your question. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dori, and thanks, Sayong. Um, our next question is from Sylvie Loma, but she's um, asked me to read it on her behalf. Um, she's interested in one of the early slides, Doria, on country of origin, and she's okay. asking, kind of curious about what shapes, um, you know, where students come from, I think, and, and curious about the, you know, the, the potential impact of cultural factors, cultural identity and religion in that. I mean, do you have any comments about that? I mean, it is interesting that Malaysia draws heavily from Middle East, South Asia, and East Asia. Okay. And uh, Muslim and non-Muslim, um, I would have thought, but quite a substantial number of Muslim students coming in. And that yes. perhaps is part of the comparative advantage, if you like, of Malaysia in the global, global scene. Okay. Uh, allow me to reshare that particular slide. Um, okay, this mm -hmm. one. So um, now um, there are multiple studies on this, but uh, apparently what, what, what comes down to the main factors is um, affordability. Apparently these countries mm. choose Malaysia because they, they can afford it. Uh, number two, uh, cultural similarity, um, especially for Indonesian students. Um, essentially mm. you're just a few hours away from, from Malaysia the language is the same, uh, your is practice same. is the same. So uh, these factors are actually the main drivers uh, um, that brings these students in. Um, it's an advantage uh, because uh, then you know what kind of selling points that you want to make uh, to attract international students. But at the same time, you would question uh, the very basic is, why is it that we can't uh, bring in European students into the country? Uh, the numbers have increased, but in very small increments, uh, mainly based uh, on uh, exchange programs uh, under the Erasmus Plus uh, projects. So um, it is not sustainable, definitely, because uh, when you, you are fixed on recruiting students from this, amount, this number of countries, um, you have neighboring competitors, especially China, who is pulling all the stops to actually uh, encourage students to go to the country. So um, I'm not so sure if that addresses that question, but then, uh, yeah, uh, affordability, similarity in culture and uh, local, I mean, closeness. I mean, uh, in terms of uh, regional, uh, whether it's further away or close by, that's the attraction, main attraction points. What's NER? Sorry? Which one is NER? Which country is that? In... NER is, I think, Nigeria. Oh, Nigeria, Nigeria. of course. Yeah. Um, what interested me about it was actually looking at the South Asia component and 
you see how many students come from Bangladesh and that affordability yes. factor clearly playing a role there. But when you look at per capita income, I mean, I know the distribution's a bit different in the two countries, but Pakistan and, and Bangladesh, not much, not very different in per capita terms, but a lot yeah, more people yeah. coming from Bangladesh than from Pakistan, yeah. similar populations in each case. So Bangladesh is really major provider of students for, for Malaysia. Yes, actually. Uh, let me stop sharing. Uh, our next question, we've really got the same question coming from two people. So I'm going to bring them both in to ask the question. One is Victoria Victorita Triff and the other one is Hermina Alonso. So Victorita, can you come in please? And then I'll inv also invite Hermina in before Doria answers. Hello, this is Victorita Triff from, from the University of Bucharest. Uh, first of all, I wish you all the best in this new year. Uh, congratulations, Doria, for your in very informative presentation. What are the lessons learned from the internationalization at home, please? Thank you, Simon. Yeah, thanks, Victorita. Um, Hermina, would you like to come in too? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, sorry. yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Simon. Um, Doria, again, congratulations on the on the presentation. It's very informative, very interesting. Um, I was curious to understand um, how UTI um, a strategy. Uh, what is UTI's strategy in terms of global citizen internationalization of higher education? Um, and how different it is from the findings you, you are getting from, from home students. Is it shocking to, um, is it shocking what, what, you are, what you found out or does it reflect somehow what the strategy as an institution is? Okay. okay. All right, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Victor. Victoria and Herminia. Um, I think the questions are similar, but then there are some differences as well. Uh, in terms of uh, Victoria's question, uh, lessons learned from internationalization at home, I think uh, part of my conversation with Prof. Simon just now addresses it uh, in terms of number one, uh, it might be good uh, for you to empower it from the ground level rather than uh, putting it as an institutional uh, strategy being com being implemented uh, from uh, the top or the uh, top-down approach. Um, and then another item is uh, staff. Where, where are we in terms of uh, staff empowerment? Um, again, this is coming from the study, uh, anecdotal uh, experiences shared by the students. Um, a few of them were, um, were volunteers at the residential colleges where the university uh, has, I think, more than 12 residential colleges scattered across the campus. Um, so they observed how um, the staff manage, uh, manages queries, sorry, manage queries from, uh, from the international students. Not very pleasant. That's, the, the, uh, that's all I can uh, provide for now. Um, and so it brings back to the question of uh, whether you, you have managed to somehow um, train your staff uh, to have that particular international competency to, uh, that's one thing. Uh, and then uh, the second thing is the openness to, uh, to learn and to accept the fact that um, you have people from different parts of the world coming to the campus to, to, uh, to study. So the, uh, what you can do is actually to facilitate their experience. So uh, those are the main lessons learned uh, from, uh, from the study. Uh, hopefully that addresses Victorita's question. Now, uh, Herminia's question, thank you so much for that. Uh, I was waiting for that question actually. So um, you're asking about uh, strategies in terms of whether, uh, is there a, a difference that, you, uh, that I observed between what, what uh, from the study itself and also um, what's happening at the institutional level. So uh, at the institutional level, the focus is 360 degree different. In, uh, what the university is focusing on is growing its prominence in the rankings. 
um, managing its international reputation, uh, not so much on global citizenship, if I can put uh, that up, but then uh, it, to, um, to also put this point across, um, the international office uh, has tried uh, a hard for the past few years to actually enable or uh, at least facilitate the process of um, uh, instilling global citizenship uh, among the students. So one of the uh, signature events is um, Culture Cafe. Uh, now that uh, I, I almost forgot about the name. So this is where um, there's a series of uh, two to three hour sessions uh, in periodical weeks throughout the semester where international, international students and domestic students come together and talk about any uh, things, um, weddings, food, uh, what, um, and certain culture, certain uh, things that are distinctively unique, uh, uh, at which provides a, a learning opportunity for, um, for the, the student population. That said, uh, if I can uh, re-emphasize, um, the activities are limited. Uh, in terms of scope, uh, in terms of the number of activities organized, in terms of the number of participants that can participate. So again, it comes down to, uh, would it be possible for us to empower uh, in the classroom, especially uh, coming back to the important component of having internationalization of curriculum as a main driver? Uh, I'm not sure if I answer that question, Herminia, but thank you so much for, for your question. Uh, passing back to Prof. Simon. Uh, Prof. Simon, you're on mute. Yeah, thanks. I've got off it now. <laughs> uh, you know, thanks for you know for, for both questions from uh, from him, Himenia and Victorita. Uh, the next question is from Rosalinda Alias. If she's there. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Doria. Good job. Hi, Prof. Ross. Thank so you, so you for 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 supporting <laughs> me tonight. <laughs> okay, because uh, yeah, as you know, I. At the, I think I played a big role in terms of uh, the international student recruitment at UTM. And uh, I have to disagree with you in the sense that the main defense and the main justification that I made to the university, especially to the local students, in terms of why we had to increase the number of international students uh, in, in UTM was for their benefit, was for uh, the internationalization at home agenda which is for global citizenship. But uh, as you know, 15 years down the line, we see that it didn't quite happen as the way that we wanted it to happen. And then COVID-19 happened. So now, how do you think that uh, we, UTM, should pursue the whole agenda about, the whole reason is for the local students, is for the internationalization of the students. So now that we have this whole uh, pandemic uh, scenario, how should we then uh, internationalize our local students? Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Rose. Uh, Prof. Simon, if I can give a context uh, to uh, Prof. Rose's uh, background, she's actually uh, the, deputy, the previous Deputy Vice Chancellor for Academy and International, um, very instrumental in driving the internationalization agenda at the university. And thank you so much, Prof. Rose, for coming uh, at such late night. Uh, session. Uh, coming to your question, I think, um, okay, this is anecdotal, but then uh, I, I don't have a direct response to your question. Uh, if I can take the example of uh, Prof. Simon's uh, webinar session. Ever since COVID happened, uh, I have been attending the sessions um, every week, and I actually look forward to it. That is where I learn from different parts of the world, uh, what happened, what's happening in terms of the higher education landscape. So um, I suppose we have to be creative. Uh, we can't give money to students to go out. They can't go out anyway. Um, probably it would be good to diversify the content that we feed to the local students. Um, I realize that, okay, I might be uh, sack for, for saying this, but the local content that we provide to students uh, throughout the semester is, um, is very localized. We, it, it might be a good time to actually start looking at, uh, for example, the number of collaboration uh, that we had, uh, the network, uh, how do we empower those networks to actually interact with our students? 
So the online global classroom that has been implemented for the past one semester since um, since COVID happened, uh, for context, online global classroom refers to uh, um, sessions like this, where uh, students from different parts of um, the partnership come together and learn things. It, it, it is a good initiative, uh, minimal costs uh, without any barriers, uh, very much uh, internet enabled and um, app enabled. So probably we have to start looking at that. Uh, I think um, the local students might not know what they don't know. So we might need to work a bit harder to expose them to what's happening outside. So I'm uh, not sure if I answered that question for first, but thanks. As for always, you're always very articulate. <laughs> I think you answered it perfectly. Again, congratulations, Zoria. And Thank you, Prof. <laughs> yes, I thought it was a good answer too. Um, Dashini is our next question. Dashini. Hello, Doria. Um, Hi, I'm Darshini. I'm a PhD student here in uh, Oxford uh, and uh, also fully fellow Malaysian. So I just wanted to say hello <laughs> from another Malaysian. Um, I, I really loved your presentation and I just wondered, uh, so, so I have one question actually that's it's sort of piggybacking from So Young's, but I just wanted to uh, take the discussion slightly further. So do you think that context and culture, and I'm using culture here, you know, with very broad strokes. Uh, do you think the context and culture of UTM might have influenced your findings as opposed to say um, other universities that have more robust internationalization exposure or uh, universities that have already started creating an identity of a global university? You know, for example, uh, universities such as University of Science Malaysia or University of Malaya. Um, I just wanted to know your thoughts about those. Okay, uh, thank you, Dashini, for that question. Uh, yes, I agree with you on that. Uh, the composition of students, uh, where they come from, what's the experience, uh, what have they done uh, throughout um, um, their, their student life actually affects a lot. Uh, as you can see, uh, I, think, um, I think one of the slides that I, I actually highlighted, only four of them went abroad before. Uh, and these are our personal trips. So uh, to an extent, uh, um, I might say that um, the students um, might not might be not be able to afford uh, international experience in terms of travel abroad, uh, and that uh, affects them. And then another thing is um, the com community that they interact with is very local community for uh, um, homogeneous population. So it might also affect their, their, their worldview. So yes, uh, the, the population does affect. Uh, not sure if I answered that, that uh, correctly. Uh, yeah, no, thank you so much. That's, uh, that's a very interesting take on that. Um, I actually have an, another question, actually, you know, two questions. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> no. So I, I really thought that your finding um, when it comes to um, the experience with the international faculty. I thought that was really, really interesting when you talked about how um, the local students uh, were the ones who tried to adjust adjust their you know, instruction. You know, they, they, they didn't expect the faculty member to adjust their instruction style, but rather they kind of accommodated. And I thought that yeah. was very interesting because in internationalization literature, we find that- um, It's the other way around. It's the other way around, right? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, so, what are your thoughts about this? Do you think that uh, there's a difference in terms of how students are interacting with the international faculty, for example, international faculty from the Western world as opposed to maybe uh, the ASEAN region or you know Asia? Okay, um, the because the sample is small, so they um, but and then they highlighted the fact that the international faculty that they interacted with are mainly from Asia. Uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, these are the main countries. Uh, very few from uh, the West. So um, I would say that when the students shared with me how they adjusted, um, I think it's their, uh, their personality, meaning to say these students were like, okay, um, it might be because of me. Uh, I do not understand what the lecturer is talking about. 
And I think uh, another angle is that, uh, again, not sure if I'm answering your question, but uh, the respondents highlighted that um, they are inspired by how the international staff uh, commit themselves to teaching, um, especially when they can't understand uh, a particular topic or a particular sub, uh, concept. The staff will go all the way. Uh, they will explain again and again through using different methods, uh, providing additional resources, uh, providing additional uh, activities until the students say, yes, I get it. So um, probably it's more on human human uh, nature. Like, uh, again, you're just being nice. Okay, the yeah. this, this staff is teaching you and then uh, the most you can do is probably um, adjust to, uh, to the shortcomings uh, available and work on what works best for, for everyone. Again, not sure if I answered that question. You have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doria. Thank Thanks you, Dashini. Take care. Uh, we do have another question um, from Rosemary Dean. Hi. Well, greetings from sunny Windsor in lockdown, England. And that was a really, really <laughs> interesting presentation, uh, Doria. And I mean, I haven't done. I haven't looked at it from that perspective in a research context. But when I was at PVC for education a few years ago, I used to meet all the student reps once or twice a year. And one of the things that I remember so vividly from that is not, not just home students, but students whose first language was English, but were from another country, were so, so critical of other students. And I used to say to them, you know, and they'd say things, oh, you, you know, if you're in a group with a Chinese student, for example, you know, you can't hear, understand what they're saying. And I say, yeah, what, what languages do you speak? And some of them would say, well, we don't, we just speak English. And I said, well, just think about what kind of journey they've gone through. But so, so I think there's a lot of things there that actually are probably common to a number of systems. But I wanted to ask about, you had a point about rankings that the home students didn't, when you're asking them, you know, what was the, how did they understand it and what's going on? That they didn't see the relevance of rankings. I was wondering what they thought the international students might get from that, because it seemed to me that it's quite possible that for international students as well, that the main use is to decide where to go in the first place, rather than something that actually benefits your education. Although I guess in some contexts it could. I mean, if you go to an institution which has a lot of research funding, then if you're a STEM student, for example, you might get better equipment and so on. Um, but I was oh. interested in kind of the interaction of you know, the perception of the home students about what they think the international students might get, or do they just see that as something that the university gets something from, I wonder? Uh, it's the, the other one. Uh, the last point uh, is more on the university rather than the students. But uh, the respondents did address one point, though. Uh, they realised that um, the only way for UTM, uh, my university, to actually uh, recruit more international students is to be on the rankings. Because the, uh, the point is that the higher you are, uh, the better perceived you are. Uh, and so uh, the reputation is better. Um, yeah. You get better resources. Uh, the experts are there. So um, it's purely marketing and branding exercise. So um, the international students come because of that particular brand. So uh, when, when I have asked further, um, are they okay with it? I mean, in terms of whether the local students are all right with it, they said, yeah, uh, that's the only way to go, um, even though they don't like it. And uh, a few of them actually, um, we had this extended discussion at the end where the rankings work or not, because uh, these are very in, uh, informed students. They go and read, understand the pros and cons of rankings. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the end, we all agree that um, you either in it or you are out of the, the Again, so that's how they respond to it. Not sure again if I answer your question. Yeah, no, that was really helpful. Thanks very much for that. Thank you, Rosemary. Re really good discussion, Doria, today. I'm um, one of the best webinars we've had. Simon. I think There's a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> But look, I will ask my question before we close. Um, I mean, obviously, COVID-19, tremendous challenge. You know that. We know that. Um, we have a few few cases of it in the UK at the moment. Um, but um, how are you managing in terms of international education in Malaysia? What protocols, what approaches have you taken? You know, how, um, how serious is the, the pandemic in the country in terms of international students? Ah, okay. Uh, that would be the uh, big topic. I know. Highlight. Yeah. yeah. 
okay. system highlight uh, that I should highlight as well. Um, thank you for that, Prof. Simon. Uh, now, the private sector are heavily affected uh, because of uh, the lockdown. So um, last year, they submitted a memorandum uh, to the ministry um, recommending that uh, there are certain procedures uh, put in place so that they can still function uh, as usual, uh, albeit the uh, reduced capacity. Um, at, at current point of time, uh, if I can be uh, candid, uh, even us, we don't really see uh, what's the concrete strategy out of uh, out of this uh, pandemic in terms of uh, international education. Um, all we see now is um, the sector as a whole are still is still grappling with how do we move forward uh, from from this pandemic. So um, uh, there are uh, unsatisfied rumbles around in terms of whether we can still get the numbers. Uh, but um, I would say as uh, in terms of um, resilience, we, we are adjusting. And I believe that the universe, uh, the institutions are working their best. Uh, virtual uh, recruitment um, sessions were held. Uh, they, the universities are adjusting. Um, that. That's the response to, uh, for you, Prof. Thanks, Doria. Um, Thank you, Prof. And um, it's been a good week for us. Uh, we've, the United States political system has stopped rushing towards the abyss at maximum speed. And we've had Doria on the webinar series at CG. So we welcome you um, coming back in future, Doria, after today's contribution uh, and do continue Thank you, to- Prof tune in and participate in in the webinars on an ongoing basis folks um next webinar is next tuesday and it's about bangladesh and it's being led by my colleague riyad sharjahan is in my view an outstandingly important critical scholar at uh, at um uh, michigan state in the united states um and he's going to present with two colleagues from bangladesh um tasnam emma and I'm just checking my notes. Nishago Niloy, I have not met either of them, but we'll meet them with pleasure next Tuesday. That will be a pretty good webinar too, I think. So do come in for that one. And we look forward to seeing you all then. Um, bye for now. And thanks again, Doria. Thank you.